To be healthy in your physical body, you need to eat clean. As in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. You might ask, well, how do I eat clean to be spiritually healthy? Well, you have to consume the Word of God. You have to eat the Word of God. The more you consume the Word of God, the healthier you will become. So the Bible holds so much revelation, and it is fascinating to read about the personalities of historical individuals right in the Bible. Revelation instructed a prophet to eat the Bible, eat the whole roll, and it will be sweet in your mouth and bitter in your belly. The term bitter in his belly refers to that type of purgative that cleans an individual out. It is not only about your approach to reading and studying the Bible, but also your perspective that will allow a purging out of carnal things and transforming your mind thus changing the terrain and trajectory of your life. So read the Word of God as if your life depends on it, because it really does. Welcome to our next installment, installment number four. I'm praying that you're getting something out of this series. Um, I know I am, and it's challenging me. I found it very, very exciting. I want to jump directly into our text today. It's found in the book of Revelation, chapter 10, verses 9 to 11. And then I'm going to just braid that with Luke 4 and 4. Revelation 10, 9 to 11, it says, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. It, it's almost like it had this purgative, and purgative effect. Um, on this um, prophet. And verse number 11, it says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. Jesus said in Luke 4 and 4, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And so when you're reading the scripture, it's actually having an effect on your spirit and ultimately your entire life. And if there's anything in your spirit or your soul or even in your mind that is contrary to God's original plan and purpose for your life that will, you know, lead you to compromise God's purpose and plan for your life and compromise at the level of your core values, anything that behavior or thought, anything such as a paradigm, the word of God has this pur purgative uh, uh, effect. It'll purge you of those things so that you're left with a pure life. So the word of God is important, ingesting it, eating it, consuming it. You are what you eat. When you think about the Bible, I want you to think about the Bible as a library that is comprising 66 books, all of them designed specifically for your spiritual health and your spiritual nutrition. So that means that the um, more you read the word of God, the healthier you become spiritually. And the less you read the Word of God, the more emaciated you're going to become and weak you're going to become spiritually. So there's a scripture that says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And a part of his power is the Word of God. The Word of God is really, really powerful. And by studying the Word of God, it's going to help you to maximize your potential, to fulfill purpose. It's going to give you the ability to live holistically, live a clean life. We talk about clean eating. Well, the Bible, reading the book Bible, is clean eating. You eat clean because you want to stay healthy as it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. You not, you not only want to live a healthy, holistic life, but when you consume the Word of God, when you eat the Word of God, it helps you to progress, succeed, and prosper, and then live as God's 
earthly representative here on earth. So think of the Bible as a collection of writings from a variety of different authors or writers at different times, at different seasons, at, di at different epochs of history. So if you're a history buff, you'll, you'll definitely get something out of the Bible. If you're a phil philosophical individual or scientific or theologian, you definitely are going to get something out of the Bible because it was di written during different epochs of history. And not only was it written during different epochs of history, it accentuated, it's, it's accentuated by the superpowers that you read about. You read about the superpower um, of Egypt and the superpower of Greece and the superpower of Rome with all the Roman emperors. You read all of that in your regular history books, and they're all um, a part of uh, the background or the context of many of these writings. I mean, you know, I was just studying the life of uh, Napoleon the Great, who was um, a protege of Aristotle. And uh, Napoleon the Great he conquers all of these um, lands. And um, he, you know, when you read about it, a lot of times we think of the Bible as this, this, this book that is just ancient and it doesn't have any relevance. But then you read about Napoleon the Great and him conquering this Persian empire. But then you read the book of Esther, which is set in the Persian empire. And so there's so much relevance uh, to reading the word of God because it is um, not just about the human history, but it's accentuated by these superpowers that we read about and these magnificent minds and philosophers. And, you know, their lives were lived during the life of many of the characters that we read about in the Bible. And in some ways, it's, it's easy to approach the Bible by understanding that, listen, these are actual historical figures, many of which, if you read in a regular history book, you'll find their names mentioned. If you go back in, in, in time, you'll find many of these um, uh, people that we read about in the Bible mentioned. And so it's worth reading the Bible in chunks rather than trying to read the whole Bible at once. Read it like it's uh, 66 books. I read about, I consume on, on an average, a book a week on an average. There's sometimes I get through two books, a, a lot of different subjects I, I'll read on and meditate on. But if I read a book a week, that means if it's 66 books in the Bible, even if I wanted to take um, a book of the Bible and focus on that book in, in a week, I can read the whole Bible in 66 weeks or just over a year. Um, some of the books of the Bible are short. Some of them are just one chapter. So it's possible that you can read several of the books in one week. But the Bible is not just this ancient book written by these spiritual sages. It has spiritual relevance as it gives us a glimpse into human progress and it gives us a unique perspective on history itself. And so when you're reading the Bible, you are really bolstering yourself, not just in terms of your spiritual growth, but even academically, intellectually, philosophically, and not just spiritually. Reading the Bible, again, I'm using that word, is simplex. It's simple when you understand that the Bible is about the king and his and his kingdom and his children. And it's simplex because you know from Genesis to Revelation, it, it, it's really about Jesus and the personality of Jesus and what he brings to the world holding all things together. But the complexity is, is, is driven not so much about the wording because we have a lot of different versions that you can read nowadays. You don't need to read the King James Version, your grandma's version. There are other modern day versions that that are written that like the message and NIV um, and the new American standard. There's so many versions, the passion uh, Bible. Um, there's so many versions that you can read, but when you're reading it, it's not so much about the words. It's about how intricate it is. 
because it, it weaves history and culture and um, the proclivity of human beings not to want to respond in a positive way to God's law. And it's got so many different moving parts to it. So when you read the Bible, it's life-giving. You're going to consume it, eat the book. But it's it, you consume it because... When you read it, I think you should approach it from this perspective, that if when you're reading the Bible, read it like your life depends on it. And then arrive at the point after you finish reading it that it really does, and it truly does. So when you're reading the Bible, big picture here, you're going to peer into the first five books called the Pentateuch. And there you're going to find the fingerprint of God on every page. In the first book, it, 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 it was authored by Moses, and it gives some powerful instructions. You know, when you get to Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and if you want to sort of fast um, or uh, jump over a couple of the pages, if you read Deuteronomy 11, 18 to 28, fantastic. It, te- it talks about what you should do when you, when you read the Bible, how you should study the word of God, how it should be um, a daily activity. And, and it, it just gives this uh, beautiful poetic language when it says, take my words and lay it up in your heart and in your soul and bind it for the, uh, a sign upon your hand that they, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes and you should teach them to your children and speak of them when thou sit down in the house and when thou walkest in the way and when you lay down, when you rise up and write them upon the doorposts and the house and the gates and, 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 and it just, Uh, goes on and then it says that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land, which the Lord swear to your fathers. And I love it because one of the statements that I, I, I said is that you should read the Bible as if your life depends on it, because it truly does. And, and it's, and I'm only echoing what one of the authors said, the author by the name of Moses said about the book. So when you're reading it, read the entire Bible and, and post its promises on your mirror. Put the promises on your mirror. Read the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and you will understand the creator. Read the last book of the Bible straight to the final benediction, and you'll see the, the creator's signature. If you lean in the books of the prophets, you'll begin to understand and know God. If you read Proverbs, you will be able to apply its wisdom in all areas of your life. If you read the Psalm, you're able to craft, use those um, verses to either um, uh, shape your worship or even use it to uh, construct and engineer and craft your prayers. When you read Ecclesiastes, you can apply the principles to your everyday life. You can hide them in your heart, you know, so that you do not sin against God. And then you've got the New Testament. When you read the first four books, I call them like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're like these paternal spiritual brothers. You read Acts of the Apostle and you read it with passion because if you do, you're going to find God in every chapter, every verse, you're going to see that miracles on demand is possible for this day and age. I I encourage you to download the 66 books um, of, of this library on your smart devices. This is not only going to make you smart, it's going to make you intelligent because you'll have the mind of God at your disposal. So you want to be able to squeeze the instructions, the wisdoms, the strategies out. You know, when life throws you a lemon, you make lemonade. Well, this is the best lemonade Ever, because it would turn your lemon-like life into lemonade. So the scripture says that you should eat this scroll because um, Proverbs 3 and 8 says, it shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Read the entire Bible from cover to cover because it's going to shed lights on a whole lot of things that you would otherwise not know that it's there. Here is just something that I was researching the other day and I found this research that was done by the Center for Bible Engagement. 
concerning the effects that happen when you engage with scripture on a weekly basis. So they polled just under a half a million of the general population in the United States of America between eight and 80. And this is what they found. They found that when you read, when, when you read uh, scriptures one time a week, and that could be just going to church on Sunday, it didn't have any effect or the effect was negligible on a person's life. But two times a week, they found out that it had a negligible effect. Now watch this, three times a week, there was a blip on the map. There was this heartbeat, like something was starting to happen. But four times a week, it literally spiked off the chart. You would expect one, two, and three, that there would be something. But it was just like this little gradual, 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 gradually going up. But when a person read the Bible four times a week, it spiked, it went off the chart. And this is exciting because when we engage in scriptures four times a week, this is what they found out from their research. Feeling lonely dropped 30%. Anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in relationship dropped 40%. Alcoholism dropped 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant dropped 60%. Viewing pornography dropped 61%. Sharing your faith dropped, jumped, excuse me, 200%. And discipling others jumped 230%. Something happens when you read the word of God and you push yourself to read it more than four times a day, you literally will begin to shape history. You will change the terrain of your destiny. You will affect changes from generation to generation, not just in your life, in your family's life, in your husband's life, your children's life, in the community, Everywhere you have spheres of influence, just reading the Bible changes things because it changes people. Scripture says, Hebrews 4 and 12, if you're writing this down, for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Um, Isaiah 55 and 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing which I send. And so we want to jump uh, just a little deeper into why, why reading the word of God is important. But if you can just keep in your mind that scripture, so shall my word be that cometh forth out of my mouth. It says it shall prosper in the thing where do I sent it. We're going to fast forward in a few minutes and we're going to go book by book, starting with Genesis, and you're gonna see that word coming to life. But why read the word of God? The word of God will save you. The word of God will sanctify you. The word of God will satisfy you. The word of God will deliver you. It will heal you. It will guide you. It will encourage you. It will give you life strategies. The word of God is your roadmap. The word of God will give you power to overcome satanic att um, attacks. The word of God will mature you in all areas of your life, not just spiritually, but all areas of your your life. The word of God will help you to grow in faith. The word will give you hope. The word of God will give you freedom. The word of God will not only liberate you, but it will sanctify you and make you holy. The word of God is a way by which you can know God. The word of God is the way by which you can know yourself. The word of God will make you a wise per person. The word of God will bring success in every area of your life. Everything that you do, this book of the law shall not depart of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. This is in the book of Joshua chapter one, verse, verse eight. You're going to make your way prosperous and you're going to have good success. You read the word because of the value. It will help you to hear the voice of God. It will help you to know the voice of God. It will help you to, to gauge your spiritual growth 
as, as you compare your life with the word of God, it will, it will teach you humility. It will teach you leadership. It will make you powerful because it'll give you the ability to engage successfully in spiritual warfare. It, it, it will, even in your weakness, it will give you strength. It'll give you the mind of God. It re will reveal the mind of God. It re will reveal the will of God. It will reinforce the promises of God. God's word has the power to revive you. It has the power to restore you. It has the power to create. It's, it has the power to prohibit. It has the power to preserve you. It has the power to help you to, uh, revere and honor God and, and, and everything that, that God stands for. The Bible is just powerful and all of us should be a part of this revolution. I believe that in this season, one of the tools that God is going to use to prosper this world is going to be the word of God. And so it is today, eat the word of God for therein you will find not only nourishment for your soul, but a tool by which you can be an agent of change. Let's continue on the journey of exploring the Bible. As you begin to read, I want you to look at the Bible as a library that holds 66 books. With each book giving you this power-packed life lesson, which you can apply to your life you'll find that you're going to grow and mature in the things of the Lord and every area of your life. Each book serves as a road map that can direct your path. The Bible is simplex when we understand what the Bible is about, which is the king and his kingdom. That takes the mystery out of reading the Bible and makes it simple. It's complex in context because it intricately weaves biographies in and out of epochs of history. So when you read the Bible, keep that in mind. Today, we're going to meet in a library called the Bible. So in Revelation, um, this prophet was, was told by God, you've got to eat the book. So what I want to do now is go book to book to book or book by book and just share with you my perspective and just a few highlights that will make it more interesting for you as you make Bible reading and Bible study a part of your everyday discipline, your activities. So we've established that the Bible is a book within itself. So when the prophet was instructed, eat the book, eat this little book, eat it, consume it, it's gonna be sweet in your mouth, bitter in your belly. Well, this book is the Bible because the Bible comes from this Latin word book. It, it's Biblia, which is translated book. And so we know little books, eat this little book. It could have been one of the scrolls that was written on Revelation. It could have been the Psalms. It could have been Proverbs. Eat one of the small, small books. So if you see the Bible as a library and each one of those, these 66 books as a little book that makes up the big book, now you can understand how relevant that particular scripture is. In the book of Genesis, and I'm going to go book by book, if you consider the book of Genesis as a book of beginnings or how to begin again or how to start from scratch, any one of those will work. And if you are starting a business, if you are starting a marriage, if you are starting a ministry, how do you start from scratch? You can extrapolate a lot of principles out of it. So the book of, 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 of Genesis answers these big questions. How did the world begin? It answers the question of, is it creation or Big Bang? It also answers the question of what is the purpose of life? Is there a God? How does God relate to the world? Where did the nation of Israel come from? It, it, it answers a lot of questions about life on planet Earth. It reveals to us what it looked like back in those days. And to tell you the truth, when I read the stories of the Bible, they strangely resemble stories that I hear every single day. 
stories that I hear from of, of the news, um, people that I coach or counsel or mentor. It sounds like um, reliving stories of the Bible because it's a human story. It's stories that have human interest. It's fascinating to me. And if you read it from the context of um, human um, struggle and human history, and you look at it from the perspective of these precipitating circumstances and how individuals are pointed towards God just because of their circumstances. It shows us struggles and triumphs and war and peace and um, sibling, sibling rivalry. It shows us um, ab ab about what happens when you have trouble in marriage and when you have... Um, uh, infertility. Long before there was infertility drugs, God was he healing the wombs of, 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 of a woman by the name of Sarah. So you have these amazing biographies that resembles our lives, that resembles modern time. And there are nine distinct incidents and personalities that I want to just extrapolate. Of course, there are many, many more, but I just want to highlight this. In Genesis 1 to 2, you've got the great creation story. You've got um, uh, Adam and Eve in probation in the Garden of Eden, them trying to figure out what it means to be human. You've got the power of the spoken word, mindset mastery, where God said to Adam, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, have dominion, um, work or be productive and live healthily. And he gives him these seven um, components of dominion. And then he throws them in a world that was beautiful, that was ab abundant, but it had problems. And the first thing he did to tap into his potential was really to solve problems. So problems give rise to the exposure of potential. And so you, you have this Garden of Eden, which is this kind of life incubator where humanity would, would be tested at the level of their innovation and creative abilities and practice the principles of dominion before being released to spread Eden throughout the world. So before there was the church, the synagogue, marriage and family, there was this enemy that hit society at its hardest point, and that is at the point of relationship. We see the relationship with man and God put in jeopardy, the relationship with husband and wife, the relationship between brothers, and then the eventually the relationship between tribes being struck by the enemy and hit at its hardest. And then we can jump over and we see um, the story of... Um, Adam and Eve, and then Adam's two sons, Adam and Eve's two sons, Cain and Abel. And then you're looking at what does it take to please God and how do you actually rise to levels of influence? So we see Abel being this influencer and Cain being jealous of the success of his brother and killing his brother. Um, and so we see the effects of jealousy and envy come into play. Then you jump over to Genesis 6 to 8. You see Noah, and this is a story of innovation and branding. This is a story where I call um, the example of a disruptor. And then he disrupts industry. We go into a new normal. And how do you actually, actually navigate the new normal? And this is why this story is so important. You navigate the new normal through innovation. And so this is a period of innovation where the playing field, literally in our generation, the playing field has been leveled. We're all on the same playing field. Every individual, every company, every industry, every country, every government, and how you emerge 
from this season of time is how you're going, your life is going to go for the next 10 years or for the next decade. And this is why innovation is important. We should be in a um, time of innovation, pushing humanity forward. We've had this hard reset. How do you begin again? How do you start over from scratch? You start over by this innovation process. And just to give you a sound bite, innovation, what innovation is, is the um, creative process of extracting value from an idea. So that means that you have to be an ideas generator. And we know that as human beings, we are ideas generating machines. We have nothing but ideas. And you use those ideas to develop, to develop products, goods, services, patents, models, methods, businesses, strategies, um, you know, with, with, with the goal of creating something that will push humanity forward, that would influence change in your industry, and that will please the end user, your customer, your client, or any external stakeholder that you might have. And they're going to use this innovative process, uh, product that you bring to the table or the goods or the services to consume, to enjoy, and exploit them for their personal use or their private use or their corporate use so that they can have success or achievement in some area of their life. They want to achieve a dream or a goal or a vision. What does that look like? They want to be thinner or smaller. They want to be more beautiful. They want to work faster. They want to have a better company. They want to have better dress, better clothes, faster transportation. And this is where innovation is, is a front and center stage. So you think of Steve and jobs, you think of Elon Musk, these great innovators. And this, when you think of the Stephen Jobs and the Elon Musk uh, in, in that time, uh, I would think of right away Noah. And then you have the next in um, the um, book of Genesis. Noah has these children, Sham, Ham, and Japheth. Sham means name, and this is a lesson on branding. Ham means passion. This is uh, how you have to approach your life, the importance of being on fire, having passion for everything that you do. And then Japheth means open in order for you to succeed in the new normal. You have to have an open mind. It means that you have to forget those things which are behind and press towards those things which are ahead of you. That's Philippians 3.30. The next um, highlight in this book is Genesis 11. This speaks of the Tower of Babel. This is the power of creativity. Creativity is innate in all of us. You can look at a little child and see that creativity is something that we're born with. It gives you the ability to tap into the genius of God. It's the faculty of the mind that, that you're using. And this is what really sets us apart from all other animals. So the Tower of Babel is about the power of creativity of which every human being is a creator. We create our futures. The future doesn't come from out there. The future is in here. Creative people are tinkerers. They wonder what would happen if, and they keep thinking they are out of the box thinkers. Creative people explore truth and they explore boundaries because they're boundary defi uh, defiers. Creative people are trailblazers. They are like these explorers. You have two types of people. They're pioneers they're, 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 uh, and they're settlers. And most people are settlers. Very few people are pioneers. But in this season, what the world is looking for, they're looking for new explorers, new trailblazers, and new pioneers. The third area, the third personality is Abraham. I guess if you do Abraham, you do Abraham and Sarah. Very powerful. They're both mentioned in Hebrews 11, and this is about the power of greatness. God speaks to him in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 4 in particular, of course, is speaking to him throughout his life. But then he says, look, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to give you a great name. This is the power of branding God, literally branding him. Long before branding uh, individual brands was um, a money-making um activity. You see God saying, I'm going to make you a brand. In other words, when you have personal branding, you become like a Chanel 
or Louis Vuitton or Gucci, where you live as an individual, but you die as an institution. And this is where you have um, Abraham. We are now seeds of Abraham because of this branding activity. He lived as this individual, but now year, generations, generations, and generations later, we are seed of Abraham. Therefore, we can name drop in the, in the realm of the spirit. It's exciting when God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great and you will be a blessing. And so the whole idea of greatness or being an influencer or being a power broker is so that you can use your wealth, your intelligence, your influence to bless others. The next is, um, that we want to look at is, uh, Genesis 26. Abraham has this son named Isaac. And to me, Isaac is a story of progress and prosperity. So you read this amazing story in Genesis 26 about there being a famine in the land. He plants the seed. And then, you know, he becomes this great man, this wealthy man as a result of him going against the green. Uh, many other uh, power broking nations was in this economic, uh, downturn. And though it, the economy was a, uh, beer, it wasn't a great economy. He goes into the same economy and he actually defies it and he becomes wealthy. So where the, all these nations never could, uh, benefit from this unhealthy, tired, sluggish economy, God gives him the uh, revelation of the power of the seed and he plants the seed. And then all kinds of doors begins to open, not without struggle. It talks about the, the, the nations that push them into destiny. And so what you're going through may not feel good, but it has the ability to become a catalyst that pushes you into your greatness and pushes you into wealth and pushes you into your destiny. The next story is Genesis 24, 34 to 41, 36 uh, to 40 to 43, beautiful story of Esau. When we hear the story of Esau, it's usually against the story of Jacob. You have this bad boy, you have the good boy, but uh, you know, Jacob received the blessing of the Lord and yet he did not maximize his potential. His brother Esau, although he struggled, he struggled with anger, unforgiveness. Eventually he comes on his own. He begins to recognize, Hey, I don't need to compete with my brother. And then he's, he's, he turns, uh, he, he took he took a lemon and made lemonade. So it's beautiful. It's a beautiful story how he missed his um, blessing, but yet his father gave him um, a blessing. It wasn't the one that he wanted, but he gave it his blessing. He took that lemon, turned it into lemonade. And then the story talks about how he raises these dukes and each of them were dukes of these independent states. So he gets himself together. And sometimes in our family, you might have family preference. References. You might have thing, all kinds of things that go wrong, but I say just let it go. And no matter how you were treated, you can change the direction of your destiny just by changing the narrative of your history, how you see your past, how you tell your story. You are not a victim of circumstances. All things do work together for good. The next story is the story of Jacob, and he was a businessman and an entrepreneur, and he goes and he leaves this ill-paying job. He disrupts this industry and he introduces biotech. There's so much that was going on um, with that story and it's so beautiful. I think I think if I titled that particular um, section of the Bible where it talks about Jacob and him applying these principles of engineering and life science to genetically modify animals. He produced that long before there's the modern day GMOs because he genetically modifies these cattle. And it's fantastic because, you know, I thought this is a story of what it takes to launch out in the deep, what it, what it takes to launch a new business or to a new ministry or a new idea or a new product. And it simply takes faith, faith in God, but also faith in yourself. And I can go on and on about this, but I got to jump over and talk about 
Joseph in the book of Genesis. He was this great economic engineer. And Psalm 105, verse 17 to 22, you can read that in your own time. And it, it really shows the hand of God. When you read the story, it's a sad story. You know, it seems like he's going from one bad experience to another. But in each instance, incidence, you see what is being exposed. That's the integrity of his character. And so now he becomes this economic engineer. He engineers this new economic system system, changes this sector and changes this, the entire system. So you not just, it's not just an industry shift. It's a systemic shift and God uses him to do that. And long before there was bitcoins and blockchain and, and NFTs and cryptocurrency and metaverse and the internet of things and the DeFi, decentralized finances and the CBDC, the central bank digital currency, which is the new conversation right now. But the um, uh, CBDC, you're going to hear a lot of that um, in the days to come. Before there was Web 3.0, Industry 4.0, there was Joseph. And I believe that we have a lot of modern day Josephs now, and we're going to see some great things happening. So the book of Genesis is has these major ge uh, themes, major personality. God is our creator and sustainer. God pursuit of man, man's pursuit of God, the restoration of man back to his rightful place. You see that all playing out. And then covenants. It's a book of covenants, God making covenant with man and God making covenant with the universe. And traditionally, this book um, has been uh, um, ascribed to Moses that he actually um, penned and wrote uh, the book of Genesis. I'm jumping into the, new, the next book, which is Exodus. And I call this the book, this book, The Miracle of Moving On, or God's Got You. So this is a book about incubation, birthing, deliverance. It's a book on how to overcome bondage, how to overcome restrictions, how to overcome limitations, how to leave your past behind. It's a book of God taking slaves and turning them into um, this, this, this nation and uh, delivering them and the special relationship that he has with them. Again, this book was written by Moses. So Exodus lays this amazing foundation foundational the theology in which God reveals himself um, a, 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 by a name, I am. And it reveals his attributes, his redemption, his character, his nature, his um, desires, his standards, his laws, and how he wants to be worshiped. It's all con contained in this book. You have this um, incident on Sinai, where he cuts covenant with um, this nation. It talks about the beginning of the priesthood of Israel, the role of a prophet. It's got all these ancient covenant relationships be between God and his people, and then how to administrate a nation. All of this reveals a lot. It reveals uh, God as the God of history that he's not just sitting outside, but he's shaping and molding history as he shapes and molds the character of man. So you have these personalities at play. You've got God, then there's Pharaoh, then the Egyptians, then there's Moses and Aaron and his mother and father and brothers, and this amazing story. And just from out of the book of, of Exodus, we have uh, Disney, doing the Prince of Egypt, you, way back you, you had movies being written, written because there's so much drama in it. And I can see, you know, other movies being written and performed and uh, just with this, this book in, in New York City, um, you know, at, in the theater, you, you have Joseph Coat of Many Colors and that toured the whole world. And so these um, stories are powerful stories and, and they've been materials for poetry, 
for poems, for uh, books and movies and Broadway plays, because it's about deliverance. It's about the underdogs and how they come out. And it's about how, you know, people that are uh, under despotic governance and how just through praying they can be delivered. And those of you may be listening to this and you feel the oppression in your home or the oppression in your city and you're praying hard and you're wondering, God, do you hear me? God hears you. And if you would just study the book of Exodus, you will have so much um, hope and so much encouragement. But I wanna highlight two specific incidences. One of them is the plagues. So you're going to hear about uh, the judgment of Egypt, this superpower that oppressed another nation. And God swoops in and he releases these plagues. And these are judgments that is on a nation. And there's a judgment of plagues. You can find it um, starting in um, uh, Exodus chapter 6 and chapter seven and eight and nine and, 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 and 10. And then finally chapter 11. And it, it, it talks about these um, 10, 10 plagues. And these 10 plagues were judgments over the Egyptians God, Egyptian God. So if you want to take quick notes now, you have the judgment uh, where the Nile turns into blood and it's the judgment of the Egyptian God happy, H-A-P-I. They weren't too happy after God judged them. Then there's the judgment of frogs, Hecat. This is was the god uh, or the goddesses of fertility. It was depicted as the head of a frog. So God sends these frogs in to let them know that there is a god that is bigger and stronger than your 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 frogs or this this goddess of fertility with the head of a frog. Then there was the lice or gnats, and this was judgment on a god by the name of Gab, G E B. Yeah. And so, um, it, it was, it was a judgment and Aaron waved his staff over the dust of the earth and there arose these lice and nets. So now you can understand why Disney absolutely loved, loves this book. You have the flies, which is Capri is the God of creation. Then it came the livestock, which was a judgment on Hather which is the goddess of love and protection. Um, and the livestock, of course, this God was represented as a, the head of a cow. Then you have the boils, which was a judgment on the goddess of medicine called Isis. And a God sent um, boils that could not be healed. And then there were hail. And uh, this is the goddess of the sky or not N-U-T, and um, this is why God sends hail and fire from above that is very destructive. And then there's the locust. This is the God of storms and disorder. And this is Seth. And God sent this storm cloud of locusts that destroyed their food supply. And then there was darkness, Ra. This is this famous Egyptian God of the sun, which God darkened for three days while sustaining light in the land of Goshen, where God became their light. And then finally, there's the firstborn death. Pharaoh had actually set himself up to be worshiped as a God and his firstborn died. So there would be no succession. And so you have the 10 commandments, but beyond the 10 commandments, you read, um, about, um, these, excuse the 10 judgments. And then you go into the 10 commandments. And the Ten Commandments is really, really exciting. Um, you could read about it. You could Google it anywhere. It's found in Exodus 20 verses 1 to 17. It, it reads um, uh, that you should have um, no other God before me. You shall not make any graven images um, or bow yourself down to serve them. Don't take the Lord thy God's name in vain. Then you remember the Sabbath. And it goes on with the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. Don't steal from your neighbors. Don't kill. 
uh, don't take your neighbor's wife or commit adultery and things like that. But I, I'm, I was Googling the Ten Commandments and I came across the Hillbillies Ten Commandments where they actually took the Ten Commandments and then they uh, wrote it like Hillbillies say it. And it, this was actually posted on the wall at Cross Trails Church in Harlan, Kentucky. And it's called the Hillbillies Ten Commandments. It's just Ten, ten Commandments made easy. And this is how they say it. Just one God, honor your mom, pa. No telling tales of gossiping. Get yourself to Sunday service. Put nothing before God. No fooling around with another fella's gal. No killing. Watch your mouth. Don't take what ain't yours. Don't be hankering for your buddy's stuff. But I dug a little deeper and I found something. The Ten Commandments in Ebonics. And this is hilarious. So I'm going to try to do it. I'm not good <clears throat> in speaking Ebonics, but I'm going to do the best I can. So here's the Ten Commandments in Ebonics. I'm your God, so don't play me. Two, don't be making no hood ornaments or charms out of me or like me. Number three, don't be calling my name for no reason. Put some respect on my name. 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 So that's that one. That's number three. Don't be calling my name for no reason. Put some respect on my name. Number four, y'all better be in church on Sunday and not just Sundays when it's Mother's Day, Easter, or Christmas. Number five, don't diss or cuss out your mama. And if you know your daddy and who your daddy is, don't diss him either. Number six, don't be going around on a drive-by. Number seven, stick to your own shorty, boo. Number eight, don't be borrowing stuff and not give it back. Number nine, don't be snitching on another man. Number 10, don't be eyeing your homie's spot, your crib, the stuff, the bag, the gig, the ride, or your homie's woman. And that's the 10 commandments. These this book is about laws, it's about how to govern a nation, and then it talks about, you know, uh, uh, worshiping God, and it, it places the worship of God front and center stage, because this is where God instructs Moses to actually build a temple so that the presence of God was the center attention in the nation, and then God will make that nation prosperous. Number three is the book of Leviticus. This is a book of growing strong in the things of the Lord through practicing his presence. Again, this is a book that was authored by Moses. And this is a great book. The box stops here. Um, and Leviticus receives his name from this Septuagint, um, the pre-Christian Greek translation of the Old Testament. That means that it relates to the Levites. So with the, this book, you're going to see a whole lot of thing about being holy, the Levites, Aaron, the Le Levitical priesthood. It talks about some of the um, holy days, uh, the year of Jubilee, the day of atonement. And the big thing is worshiping God and you being holy and approaching God with holiness. So in this particular book, he, he, he's saying that you cannot come into my presence if you've touched dead things like dead body, body fluids, things like mold, and you had to be purified before you entered into the presence of God. And if you entered into the presence of God and you weren't purified, you were killed. So it's just a lesson on holiness. How do you approach a holy God? You approach the holy God by being holy yourself. So this book talks about the five main offerings, the burnt offering, the grain fellowship, sin, guilt offering, and a couple of other um, regu um, additional regulations for offering. You see the installation of the ministry of Aaron and his sons. You see this big ordination service, service going on with Aaron and his sons and the ministry of the priests. And you see a couple of people dying. And then the what 
what God calls clean and how to purify after a child's birth, how to deal with skin diseases, mildew, and things like this, basically, to stay clean. And then we have the introduction of the annual Day of Atonement, and then it goes on about how to live a holy life, um, eating um, the eating of blood that was prohibited, unlawful sexual uh, relationships, and all of the regulations for the priest is just a, a book on how to be holy. The next book is Numbers, and this is um, about spiritual uh, maturity. So this is a life lesson where they go from just this toddling nation and they're entering into spiritual adolescence. This is where Israel fails and they roam around the wilderness for 40 years. But it's a beautiful story about mentorship because you see this mentor relationship between Moses and um, his protege, uh, Joshua, and Joshua was such a great protege. And he, uh, in 40 years, God had actually taken a slave through a process, just through mentorship. So he went from being a slave to a spy, to a soldier, to a servant leader, and then to a sovereign leader. He became the first prime minister of a new nation in their new, new land beyond the walls of Jericho. So numbers, if I gave it a title, it's called The Long Way Home. And God doesn't waste anything about your life. Sometimes people take the short way. There's sometimes people take the long way. But once God gets you there, I tell you, everything is going to be um, all right at the end. So don't give up. Keep trusting God even if God takes you the long way home. The next book after that, so we've done Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Now we're in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Deuter 2. So that means this is the second time you're going to hear some things. And it's really a recap lesson, um, lessons that you learn in the book of Numbers. Um, and this is um, Moses giving Israel instructions. Um, and then, you know, Deuteronomy, this is the last time you're going to see Moses. He gives his farewell speech. It's fantastic. And then he um, gives this blessing on the tribe. And then you see the death of Moses and the succession of Joshua that takes you to chapter number 34. There's a lot of um, scripture that's there that you could pull out the promises. But one of my favorites is Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14. Besides, it's a whole series of others. But this is uh, one of the blessings that was pronounced on Israel, and I'm pronouncing the same blessing on you. And I'll just give you just a recap. It's a blessing that says that you're going to be overwhelmed with blessings, that you're going to have stress-free living, you're not going to need a happy hour, your whole life will be happy, that God will give you parental success, you're going to raise up strong, healthy, successful children, God's going to give you real estate, he's going to increase your uh, investment portfolio, he's going to give you debt-free vehicles, cars, SUVs, airplanes, he's going to increase your checking account, your savings account will never be overdrawn, he's going going to um, make you happy going to work and happy coming back from work without any incidences or accidents. He, you're going to have supernatural sweatless victory. You're going to live financially independent. You're going to be guaranteed success. You're going to live righteous. You're going to have abundance. You will, you'll never be broke another day in your life. You'll have innovation. Um, God will give you Wall Street friendly, globally, globally scalable businesses. You'll proliferate and increase in your network. And God is going to make you CEO, CFO, COO, CIO, governors, presidents, mayors, heads of states, and all of that just by following him as well as obeying him. The next book is the book of Joshua. 
And I call this a book, Empowered for Success. Most of it is about the leadership of Joshua taking them into the promised land. And then this book um, really is about how property, property was divided up. It's about the conquest, the capturing of the promise or the vision. It's about how God delivers even people that are on the fence. Um, in this instance, we're introduced to Rahab, who literally lived on a wall. And so you have the entrance to the land, this exciting conquest, the crossing of Jordan, the victory at, at Jericho, this covenant, and then they start divvying up the land um, until you get to the apologue. And the apologue, um, the tribal unity, they vow their loyalty to the Lord. And then, of course, like the ending of the previous book with the death of Moses, in chapter 24, I think it is, verses 29 to 32, you have the death and burial of Joshua and also Eliezer. We're introduced to the book of Judges now, and this is about breaking cycles. So in the book of Judges, you're introduced to all these judges. They go off wandering, wandering doing their own thing. They get into bondage. God raises up a deliverer. They're fine. They say, we're going to do better the next time. Then they fall into um, bondage again, and then God raises up a deliverer. So it's, it's a book on how to break cycles. So the first judge is Othniel. So Othniel, it, it means uh, God's force is strong as a lion. So that's Othniel. He's the nephew of Caleb. Caleb is one of the 12 spies. That's the first judge. The second judge is Ehud, which means where's the glory? Where's the glory? And he was left-handed and he brutally kills the king of the Moabites. So it, it, it was interesting. The second one, Ehud, um, very strong and very powerful. Then the third is Shemgar, meaning sword. So God raises up this guy that's as sharp as a sword. And the Bible said in the days of Shemgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths because there was so much crime on the highways. So then they developed these paths to avoid the crime and Shemgar um, shows up at that particular time. And um, you can read the, the, the story of Shemgar. It's really fascinating. Um, in the days of Shemgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Really fascinating um, when you read about that. After Shemgar, of course, they go into bondage again. God raises up another judge, and this judge is called Deborah. She's this prophetess, and she's this judge. She's these, uh, this anomaly, anomaly, and it, her name means honeybee. She's a married woman, but she's powerful. She's married to this man by the name of Lapidoth, and you see this power couple. In, in scriptures, you see a whole lot of power couple, but I love this one because he had his own and she had his had her own. And here you see a combination of both influence and dominion working hand in hand. She serves after um, Ehud, um, but the Bible said Ehud did evil, and then God raises up this woman, and I always say God will never send a man to do a woman's job. And Deborah was the first legal counsel to the military. And she also served as a military head, raised up uh, soldiers, um, and mentored Barak, who was a military um, a military uh, soldier. And he, he led uh, about um, 10,000 soldiers and slaughtered Caesarea um, in this battle. But then you see this um, supporting actress um, you had the supporting actor, which is Barack, and then you have this supporting actress, J.L., and she takes this ten peg and drives it through the head, and she's the fulfillment of Deborah's prophecy. So that's the story of Deborah. Then you've got Gideon. He's the one of the best known outside of Samson because he was this reluctant leader, and God raises him up, and um, his, his name means you are a slasher or hacker. 
And uh, you can read his story in Judges chapter six. And um, he he's just uh, a fascinating study for leadership, reluctant leader. He would be more of a phlegmatic leader if you look at um, the types of uh, personality um, styles of leaders. Um, he would be a phlegmatic one. So God uses him. He's the guy. He's he's the guy that you read about that uses the fleece for a test. God, if if the fleece is wet or and the grass is dry, or if if the fleece is dry and the grass is wet, that's when I know I have confirmation from you. And a lot of people live their lives like that. There were those that live their lives lie live their lives in such a way that they have a relationship with God that they always can recognize his voice and there are others that need confirmation after confirmation after confirmation and that would be a Gideon then the next one is Tola Tola means scarlet worm and it, it, it sounds bad but it's not because the worm that um, sacrifices his life in giving birth, also stains the bark of a tree and um, that red blood would be scraped off and then it would be used to dye materials, you know. And when you read in the Bible how uh, Tolo rose to save Israel, um, I love that. And it, it talked about the level of his sacrifice. So Tola is the one that um, was a minor judge, and he led Israel for about 23 years. Uh, he came from the tribe of Issachar, so his grandfather's name was Dodo, and um, his name was Tola. So the next one was Jair. So Jair means he that is enlightened, he will diffuse light. He's the descendant of Manasseh. He becomes this um, judge, and after Jair is Jephthah. A lot of people know Jephthah because he made a vow with God, God, if you help me to win this battle, whatever comes out of the front door of my house when I arrive home, I'll give that to you. And it happened to be his um, daughter. It's an interesting story because his father has this one night stand with this prostitute and she gets pregnant and then she doesn't want the child. So his father, who was married, takes Jephthah on and his half brothers, you know, it speaks a lot about his adopted mother who would take the child uh, of someone that your husband had messed around with and raised them. So Jephthah was this actual half brother, but his half brothers found out who he was, gave him a hard time. He enters this gang. He's, he's a part of gang violence. And he's, he's this big gang banger. And he finds God, um, or God finds him and pulls him out of the gang. And he becomes a judge. So this is sort of like, you know, the story that looks like it could possibly end up in death and him being ignoble. And then he ends up being this very noble person because of the plan that God has for his life. And this is an encouragement for, for every woman or every father whose child is in the gang, or if um, your child has been in prison, or even you, even if you've been the black sheep of your family. You know, as you read the, the stories in the book of Judges, specifically as it relates to Jephthah, I'm praying that God would speak to your heart and that he would show you your purpose and your assignment. Um, no matter how bad your story starts, you can always have a good ending. The next judge <clears throat> was um, uh, Ibzan. Ibzan is this amazing judge. Um, his name is their whiteness, literally their tin as white. So it's very interesting um, name, and God uses him again. And some scholars believe that, uh, you know, as you read the judges, it's intended to demonstrate um, how in, how God produced leaders out of each tribe of Israel. This was some of the judges. So it's Ben is a judge from the tribe of Asher. And it doesn't tell us a whole lot about him, but we know because it doesn't tell us a whole lot about it. It could be that God is just painting a picture that there's leadership in every community. 
that every family, he's going to raise up some leader in every community. And no matter what the community is like, he's going to raise up a leader out of every country, ever, every state, out of every parish. And that might be you. So as you're reading the book of Judges, maybe God is saying, I want to use you in your nation. And I want you to pray through this book as, as you're studying this book. The next name is Elon, not Elon Musk, but Elon. And before there was an Elon Musk, there was Elon the judge. He came from the tribe of Zebulun. And um, there's only a few sentences. Actually, we only get about two sentences about him, but it's enough for him to make history. Um, so he's a judge. He, he, he played, um, I think, a military leadership and it was a time of, of, of peace, you know, and his name means oak, oak. It's a type of tree that's very, very strong. And um, so we have Abdon, number 11, which is a minor judge, Abdon, and his name is, um, uh, means service or servile or someone who provides service, and another way that we can look at him is as a servant leader. So God raises up servant leaders um, out of uh, out of everyone, and and the whole point of leadership is to serve your people. Um, a lot of scholars believe that Abdon actually was very very wealthy because his family owned seven donkeys. So owning owning seven donkeys back in those days simply means that you had a large family, you had to feed them. Thus, he was very very wealthy. So he came from a prominent family and a place of wealth, but yet he was able to humble himself as a servant leader. Again, he came, comes from the tribe of Asher. And then of course, the most famous of all is Samson. And his main name means like the sun. So this is probably one of the beloved outside of Deborah, but one of the most beloved judges. You hear so many sermons about him. Um, he was impulsive, he was lustful. He had this uh, love for Philist Philistine women. You know, the, you're gonna read the story of how he had a bad hair day, literally. Um, and he has this bad haircut, he loses his strength. But in the end, the story is so beautiful. He did such a great work at the end of his life um, where he brought the house down, literally, and destroyed his enemies. And so Samson, um, is a story of, of greatness, but how arrogancy can bring the strongest man down. At the end of his life, he was able to trust God again, grew his hair back, and connect with his original um, uh, purpose. And there you have the story of Judges. There's a whole lot of other stories that go on, but because it's the book is named Judges, it's going to be about judges. The next book is the book of Ruth. And I call this a book uh, where you find your field of favors. Um, it's a story of this, this woman who loses her husband. And um, a few years before, her mother-in-law's law loses her husband and her sister-in-law loses her husband. And it's the story of sister survivors and how she finds her field of favor. It's a great book. It's a great study. Um, and it's a great study of uh, women of virtue and character and dignity and how you can win without sleeping your way to the top, literally. She marries a very wealthy man and um, who dies a day after uh, she marries and she inherits everything. And of course, Jesus is seen there as the kinsman redeemer. The next is the book of First Samuel. And um, this is a book, it's interesting. What happens when you think the grass is greener on the other side? So this whole nation says, oh, all the other gods, all the other nations have kings and we just have you, God. Why can't we have a king? So God gave them the desires of their heart and then you read the story of how the nation struggled after that. So the book of 1 Samuel, 
the prophet Samuel is raised up, and then he's a king maker. And then you also are introduced to the story of David, a very interesting story. Goliath is this terrorist, and he shows up, he's threatening the entire nation and threatens their God. And then David shows up in modern day vernacular, he says to Goliath, so you want a bamba? You want to chill with the big boys? Now your dad run kitty kitty and run kata kata, you know that story, whatever it is. Um, and then no fit for the drink cup. And then, you know, this is what, uh, what basically uh, the song is all about. So David says, you want a bumba, you want to chill with the big boys, and then slays him. And so this book is about the tale of two kings. One who um, was good looking, had everything going for himself, but suffered from insecurity. And another one similar who suffered from insecurity. But the difference between the two is one relied on themselves and operated from insecurities and the others took their insecurities to God and relied on God. Both of them were insecure, but one relied on God and the other relied on himself. He was driven by a need to be seen. Um, he was driven by his insecurity. So he suffered from what I call the imposter syndrome. And that was Saul. First Kings is the next book. This is the 11th book and we're halfway there um, for tonight's lesson. And if you need to take a break, take a pause, go get some water, or you could take a pause and then you could pick it back up tomorrow. But I wanna just um, continue on and it won't be long after this. The next book is First King. This book is about how to lead with integrity. So the kingdom of Israel has a time of peace and prosperity under King Solomon. But afterwards, there's this split between Jeroboam and Jeroboam, and you have the two lines of kings turning away from God, these two lines. Nobody knows who wrote the book, but this is basically um, how the book of First Kings is written. Um, and you see Solomon, uh, one of the most powerful, wealthiest kings ever. And then, you know, also in the book of First Kings, you've got another story going on, and it's the story of Elijah and how he's challenging um, the gods that Israel is worshiping. Second Kings is about a power shift. So 2 Kings continues this saga of Israel and their disobedience, the split of the kingdom. You see the conclusion of Elijah's ministry. You see the rise of Elijah. People love Elijah, but yet Israel is spiraling down in faithlessness, ultimately being defeated and dispersed by the Assyrians. So Judah, the southern kingdom, has several kings who trust God and they attempt this spiritual reform. And then you have the Northern Kingdom and then you have you know, Isaiah and other prophets actually prophesying Judah's sin that would be punished by this Babylonian conquest. And when you get into the book of Daniel, you can see Daniel um, being um, a uh, human part of human trafficking ring, and you get to the book of Daniel, but we'll get to the book of Daniel in a minute. Um, and this is when you look at Second Kings, and you know, again, in everything, God is remaining faithful, and um, you have the pending conquest of Babylon and, you know, you have Jeremiah uh, prophesying, you know, the 70 years that he's prophesying in Jeremiah 29, 10, and then 29, 11, Jeremiah said, I know the plans I think towards you, plans of good, not of evil to bring you to your expected end. So this is how these books are interlocking. Then you have First Chronicles. This is a brief history of Israel from Adam to David. It culminates with David and the commissioning of the temple of God in Jerusalem. This book historically has been 
attributed to Ezra. So this would have been one of the books Ezra wrote. So this book of First Chronicles is very interesting. Um, First and Second Chronicles was originally one book, but they broke it up into two books. So it focuses primarily on the history of Judah, the southern kingdom. Um, and you know, there's the southern kingdom and the northern, it really focuses on the southern kingdom, Judah. And it begins with this um, um, genealogy and it emphasizes David and Solomon. And then it just chronicles and it, and it, and it moves through, hence the first chronicles, a chronicle, you're chronicling uh, these uh, episodes. So first chronicles, um, it would prob like I said, was probably written by Ezra. He authored a couple of other books, but probably Ezra. So you've got in First Chronicles, everybody knows this, the prayer of Jabez from out of the um, second book of Chronicles, uh, second Chronicles 4 and 10. So you, you in, in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 12, 32, it's prominent because it, it talks about the sons of Issachar and the children of Issachar, which were man that had understanding of times to know what Israel ought to do. So we know those two prominent um, uh, scriptures that is quoted and preached about a lot. And you will find that in the book of Chronicles. And so, you know, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, um, you've got all of these things going on, and you've got so many um, activities that is recorded in these these two books. And it's fascinating to read. So if you're reading the first book of Chronicles, read it along with the second book of Chronicles. And you have these prayer, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. That is in the books of Chronicles. Then we're jumping into Ezra, the book of Ezra. So the book of Ezra, written by Ezra, begins where the second book of Chronicles ends. And, and, and it, it, it begins with a Persian king, Cyrus, that had been sent, uh, that had sent exiles led by Zerubbabel back to Jerusalem in 538. Persia had been defeated by Babylon in 539. So um, he was a king that actually supported Israel. Uh, you, you, Ezra was um, one, of the, one of the prophets that had prophesied many things, but Ezra actually preached God's word and led the people to repentance. So Ezra succeeded because God's hand was upon him. You will see it in Ezra 7 and 6, um, in verse 9, 28, um, uh, chapter 8, 18, uh, verse 22 and 31. So the hand of God was upon him. And, and through Ezra, God shows his, his power, but his faithfulness, that he's a covenant keeping and a covenant making God, and that he was able to move in spite of the proclivities of his people. He was going to keep his covenant with them. So in the book of Ezra, Israel is rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. And there's this scribe named Ezra who teaches the people to love God again and to obey God's word again. Then you have the book of Nehemiah. We know the book of Nehemiah. Ezra is about building this temple and just um, encouraging the people to love God and return to God. And because of God's faithfulness and that he's a covenant making, keeping God. Then you have the next book, which is Nehemiah. And I call this book, How to Succeed in 52 Days, because he was able to re rebuild the walls around the city in 52 days, what a nation couldn't do in 70 years. He did it in 52 days. And so we know that this is around 445 BC, somewhere there. The Persian king Artaxerxes sends Nehemiah, who's an Israelite, who is his trusted official, and sends him to help to rebuild the walls of Jericho. And you see um, all of the attack on Nehemiah, but Nehemiah being steadfast. And um, that he, Nehemiah, um, I think served 
um, twice as governor. So not just once, he served twice as governor, but in serving as, as governor, he also served the Lord and he served his people and he built the wall. The next book is the book of Esther. And I call this the new face of power. And so there's this plot in this book. And this whole nation is plotting and planning the extinction of an entire nation. So you see this Holocaust that is about to happen. And God raises up this woman who was an orphan and she marries a king. And then she uses his, her influence with the king to save her entire people from being executed. Um, and she thwarted off a Holocaust. So this is this Jew living in Persia, but yet defying the odds. Number 18 is about Job. And I call this a book, How to Bounce Back After a Setback. So you have this satanic attack that's going on of this righteous man, Job. Job can figure out why is this happening to me? He lost his family lost his children, lost his name, lost his health, lost everything, even the confidence of his friends. His friend is arguing, maybe you've done this terrible thing, maybe God is judging you. So it's all about um, answering the question, why does bad things happen to good people? And I still don't know. The, I mean, you know, uh, there's no particular answer. All we know is, he says, I know my Redeemer liveth. And then at the end, he, he bounces back and God gives him twice as much as he had in before. Why? Because he never judged God um, or... Um, he never uh, lost his, his faith in the integrity of God. The next book is Psalms. And you're talking about Super Soul Sunday. There's Super Soul Monday, Super Soul Tuesday, Super Soul Wednesday, Super Soul Thursday, Super Soul Friday, Super Soul Saturday, and Super Soul Sunday. This is a collection of about 150 songs written by several different people. Usually everybody thinks that only David wrote um, the Psalms, but there's uh, all kinds of writers. David writes the vast majority of it, but there's Asaph who wrote it, Korah who wrote songs, Solomon wrote some songs, Moses, Moses wrote some songs, Ethan wrote some songs, um, but he wrote the vast majority of them. And then you have about 50 of the Psalms, they, they call them orphan songs because it's not credited to any author. But these are songs, songs. Um, and, and psalms that are written, and you can use this to worship. Like I said, you can use the psalms to shape your prayers in. After the book of Psalms, you have Proverbs, which is wisdom for winning at life. These are a collection of saying, of course, the author is Solomon and a few other wise men. They write Proverbs, and it's Proverbs for practical living. The next book is, um, after Proverbs, is Ecclesiastes, and this is about the meaning of life. It's a philosophical book. It explores life and life meaning, and it re it's 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 a, just a reflection uh, of someone that is philosophizing and trying to figure out life. And then I want to throw in just this last book, the Songs of Solomon. Why? Because it's a book of songs, and it's the uh, songs. Uh, in the key of life or songs in the key of love. This is a book about how to make love last. It's a book of love songs. So there you have it. And I want you to return for our next installment so we could take a look at some of the other books of the Bible. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that as you went through each one of the books of the Bible that you garnered some nuggets that would set your Bible reading and Bible studying time ablaze. This is a partner-sponsored and donation-driven channel. If the Lord places in your spirit to support us, please feel free to give your seed right now. Remember, within each seed is a divine eternal instruction to become bigger than itself at any given moment. And that, when you plant a seed, 
it goes into automatic reproduction. So I encourage you to plant your seed right now, whether it's a $1,000 seed or $500 or $100 seed or the 75 covenant seed or even a widow's mite. You can do so by visiting cindytremministry.org slash give. Thank you so much once again for watching and we look forward to seeing you next time. God bless and as always, is a pleasure to do life with you in real time. Bye for now. Have you heard about the Cindy Trim Ministries app? This is where you can dive into our world of ministry. Just update or download the latest version of the app for free in the Apple or Google Play Store. On the dynamic home screen, you will continuously be up to date with the latest news, empowering teachings, and live streaming services. Become the leader you were born to be and establish your own empowered life group as you watch on-demand messages and access free discussion guides for each message. There's more empowerment at every click. Engage in the latest event hosted by Dr. Trim and find out when she's going to be in a city near you. Giving is easy. Donate now by selecting the Give button inside of the app. Download the Cindy Trim Ministries app now and begin your journey of empowerment with us today. Thank you.